Good day, my friends, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Daily Torah Broadcast, a ministry of the Messianic Discipleship Institute. You can always visit us online at mymdi.org and download previous episodes of the Daily Torah Podcast. Contact us and let us know what you are learning so far. Today we are on day one of this week's Daily Torah series called Metzora, which means cleansing the leper. Yesterday we finished our series on Tazria, with God instructing us on the laws regarding the treatment of leprous garments and mildew. Today our Torah portion opens by describing the purification process in accompanying sacrifices for one healed from leprosy. If you have your Bibles and notepads handy, get them ready or listen and review later. But let's pick up the story in Leviticus chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. In Leviticus chapter 14, verse 1, we read, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall examine him. And indeed, if the leprosy is healed in the leper, then the priest shall command to take for him who is to be cleansed two living and clean birds, cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. As for the bird, he shall take it, the living bird, he shall take it, the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop, and dip them in the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed from the leprosy, and shall pronounce him clean, and shall let the living bird loose in the open field. In verse 8, he, he who is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes, shave off all his hair, and wash himself in water that he may be clean. And he shall come into the camp, and he shall stay outside his tent seven days. But on the seventh day he shall shave all the hair off his head and his beard and his eyebrows. All his hair he shall shave off. He shall wash his clothes and wash his body in water, and he shall be clean. Now, my friends, the law of the leper required that the afflicted person be brought to the priest for examination. The priest would go outside the camp to assess the leper's condition. If the leprosy was healed, the priest would declare the person clean. In a spiritual context, this reminds us that when we withdraw from those who walk disorderly, spiritual lepers, we should not treat them as enemies, but admonish them as brethren. When God's grace brings someone to repentance, we should receive them back with tenderness and joy. Now remember, my friends, this condition of leprosy is brought on by speaking Lashan Hara, the evil tongue, and the only way one could be healed is by going to God in heartfelt repentance. The priest commanded two living and clean birds, cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop. One bird was killed over running water in an earthen vessel. The living bird, along with the other items, was dipped in the blood of the slain bird. The priest sprinkled this mixture seven times on the cleansed leper and pronounced him clean. The living bird was then set free in an open field. From a messianic perspective, the two birds represent the death and resurrection of Yeshua the Messiah. The cedar wood signifies his incorruptible nature. The scarlet thread symbolizes his shed blood. The hyssop branch was used for pur purification. This ritual points to the cleansing power of Yeshua's sacrifice. His blood purifies us from sin, and through his resurrection we are set free. Now tomorrow we will examine this ritual further as there is a second part to it to complete the cleansing. For today, let's go into our half Torah portion in 2 Kings chapter 7 in verses 3 and 4. But first, 
Let's get the backstory in 2 Kings chapter 6, starting in verse 24. So in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 24, we read, And it happened after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and indeed they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and one-fourth of a cab of dove droppings for five shekels of silver. Now, my friends, this was during the last week. We, we talked about Elijah. In that and now there's a famine in the land. Syria is gathered around all their armies to Israel. And the king of Israel is blaming Elisha for this calamity. Then in verse 1 of chapter 7, we read, Then Elisha said, or Elisha, however you want to pronounce it, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow about this time, a seah of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. So an officer on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could this thing be? And Elisha said, in fact, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Now, my friends, though the king of Israel blamed the Lord for the calamity that came upon Israel and Samaria, God still had a word for the king and the nation, and it was a good word. God's promise through Elisha was that in 24 hours, the economic situation in Samaria would be completely reversed. Instead of scarcity, there would be such abundance that food prices would radically drop in the cities. The king's officer doubted the prophecy, and his doubt was based on several faulty premises. Number one, he doubted the power of God. Two, he doubted the creativity of God. And three, he doubted the messenger of God. All in all, the officer well illustrates the conduct of unbelief that I want to go over. The conduct of unbelief dares to question the truthfulness of God's promise itself. Unbelief says, this is a new thing and cannot be true. Unbelief says, this is a sudden thing and cannot be true. Unbelief says there is no way to accomplish this thing. Unbelief says there is only one way God can work. And unbelief says even if God does something, it won't be enough. My friends, we must be careful we don't harbor a spirit of unbelief in today's society and everything that is swirling around us right now. I think Charles Spurgeon says it best. He says, unbelievers do not really enjoy the things of this life. The mass of them find that wealth does not yield them satisfaction. Their outward riches cannot conceal their inner poverty. Too, too many men it is given to have all that the heart can wish and yet not to have what their heart does not or what their heart does wish not to have it they have everything except contentment my friends we cannot have this spirit of discontentment and of unbelief now let's continue in verse 3 of our half Torah portion which actually begins today in verse 3 of 2 Kings uh, chapter 7. So here we go in 2 Kings 7 verse 3. Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate and they said to one another, Why are we sitting here until we die? If we say we will enter the city, the famine is in the city, if, and we shall die there. If we sit here, we die also. Now therefore come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live, and if they kill us, we shall only die. Now my friends, these men stayed at the entrance of the gate because they were not welcomed in the city. 
their leprous condition made them outcasts and untouchables. Jewish tradition says these four were actually Gehazi and his three sons. Gehazi was Elisha's servant and was afflicted with leprosy because of his greed toward Naaman. Remember, Elisha didn't take anything from Naaman, even though Naaman wanted to pay him a lot. He took not one shekel. But afterwards, Gehazi ran after Naaman and asked him for some talents of silver. And Naaman gave it to him and more even, and even changes of clothing. You can read about that in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 20 through 27. The leprous men's logic was correct. They would soon die from the famine if they stayed by the city to receive it. Rendered to the series. Now, my friends, the lepers represent the out the unclean. Their plate mirrors the human condition, spiritually separated from God due to sin. Just as the lepers were shut out from the city, humanity is estranged from God's presence. The city symbolizes safety, but it cannot provide salvation from sin and death. The lepers chose to risk everything by going to the Syrian camp. Their decision echoes the Messianic mission. Yeshua was the ultimate outcast and he came to seek and save the lost. He willingly entered the enemy's territory, the broken world, to rescue humanity. His death on the cross was the ultimate risk, but it brought life to those who believed. Like the lepers, we too were once separated from God. And Yeshua invites us to leave our spiritual isolation and find life in him. Our decision to follow him may involve risks, but the reward is eternal. Now, let's look at our Brit Hadashah portion for today in Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 through 6. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 2, we read, And when John had heard in prison about the works of Messiah, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And Yeshua answered and said to him, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Now John the Baptist, who was Yeshua's cousin, was imprisoned by Herod Antipas. And he sends a cryptic question to Yeshua, inquiring whether he is the expected one, the Greek translation of Messiah, or if they should look for someone else. John had known Yeshua well, having baptized him in the Jordan and declared him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. However, Yeshua had not explicitly claimed to be the Messiah. While in prison, John hears about Yeshua's works and sends word through his disciples to ask, Are you the expected one? Are you the Messiah? Or shall we look for someone else? The gospel writers don't sp specify why John posed this question, but it's possible he had doubt or was preparing his disciples to follow Yeshua instead of him because he knew that he was going to die in prison. Yeshua responds with a clear yet coded answer. He points to his deeds as evidence. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor receive good news. These miraculous acts reveal Yeshua as the fulfillment of messianic prophecies. We get a glimpse of the tension between doubt and faith, human expectations and divine revelation, as John seeks assurance and Yeshua points to his trans transformative works as evidence of his messianic identity. My friends, let us not doubt 
the divinity of Yeshua and his his uh, his activity that and that he's active in world affairs in our lives today. So my friends, a little long to start this week, but I wanted to get this stuff going. I want you to get excited about what we're going to cover this week. So let's end it here for today. Take some time to meditate on these words and how they apply to your life. Pray for us in this message to go out and pray for those who are scattered throughout the world seeking their Messiah so that they will return to the Torah in their Hebraic roots. Share this message with your friends and family. Post a link on your social media pages and help us spread the gospel. You never know whose life you may affect. Remember to visit us at mymdi.org. Take one of our free classes. Download the daily Torah schedule. You can also order the daily Torah series of books to follow along. And if the Lord inspires you, please consider becoming a monthly sponsor so we can reach more people with these messages. Just click the giving menu option or donate button on the website. Tomorrow, we will continue our studies. Until then, Shalom Aleichem, blessings, and Shalom, my friends.